Uh, hello, my name is John Phillips. I'm from the University of California, Irvine, and today I'm going to be talking about a, uh, a paper we put up on the archive about a month ago and a result we have regarding uh, the quenching of satellite galaxies and a, a dichotomy we found in the quenching of satellite galaxies. So just to give a brief overview of the talk, um, some of the talks earlier have done a good job of motivating why studying the quenching of galaxies is interesting. It involves a lot of interesting physics and they're all intersecting. So what we want to do is to simplify the question. We want to look at systems of isolated L-star galaxies and look for trends in quenching with properties of the hosts and the satellites and the host satellite systems. So I'm going to spend some time talking about our primary result, which is the dichotomy that uh, passive hosts do quench their satellite galaxies and star forming hosts do not. And then uh, at the end I'm going to get into some possible physical interpretations of this results. So to talk about our sample we used um, Sloan Digital, Digital Sky Survey. Uh, we used the MPA value added galactic catalog as well as the NYU value added galactic catalog. And we um, compiled a list of potential hosts, all galaxies greater than 10 to the 10.5 in solar masses, out to a redshift of 0 0.03. And then we stipulated the hosts had to be isolated. So what do I mean by isolated? I have a little cartoon here of our isolation scheme. So that's our uh, potential host in the center. And then we define a region of radius 350 kiloparsecs around that uh, host candidate, wherein we allow no other host candidates. We need to find an annulus bounded by 350 kiloparsecs on the inside and a megaparsec on the outside, wherein we allow at most one other host candidate. And both these selection regions are bounded by 1,000 kilometers per second in velocity space. So that's what we mean by isolated. And our goal is to select hosts that have a virial mass of about a few times 10 to the 12 solar masses. And to get a handle on that, what we did is we applied our um, selection and isolation scheme to the mock observations in the Millennium II simulation. And so in the green there is a distribution of virial masses just of our fiducial isolation scheme. And then in the cyan is a distribution, a normalized distribution of the virial masses of galaxies where we've required they have exactly one satellite galaxy. And by requiring exactly one satellite galaxy, we do a better job of selecting galaxies that are strongly peaked around few times 10 to the 12 solar masses in virial mass. So then our satellite galaxies we're looking for uh, fall in the range 10 to the 9.5 and 10 to the 10.5 solar masses. And our selection region for the satellite galaxies is out to 350 kiloparsecs in projected distance and within 500 kilometers per second in uh, velocity space. And then to compare to the satellite sample, we've compiled a control sample of highly isolated satellite sized objects that have no objects as massive or more massive within three megaparsecs and 400 kilometers per second uh, in velocity space. So here's what our sample looks like in uh, specific star formation rate versus stellar mass space. We ended up with 483 host satellite pairs and we took the hosts and divided them uh, according to their membership in either the blue cloud or the red sequence and we ended up with about 280 passive hosts and 200 star forming hosts. So uh, briefly I want to discuss how we quantified our quenching. Uh, we defined a parameter we call the conversion fraction. So you can see the equation for it there is uh, F convert is equal to the fraction of satellites that are quenched minus the fraction of control objects that are quenched. So the excess fraction of quenched satellites divided by the fraction of control objects that are not quenched. So this is a fairly natural way to compare the satellites to the control sample. But if we take the control sample to be representative of the uh, progenitors to the satellite galaxies. An f-convert can be thought of as the fraction of objects that become quenched between their time of infall and now. And another benefit of thinking about quenching in this way is that we can you know, play games with what we consider quenching. So um, our sort of you know, fiducial definition of quenching in terms of satellite objects is something that has a specific star formation rate less than 10 to the minus 11 inverse years. Then we can ask questions like, well, what happens, what, what uh, is the fraction of vigorously star forming objects that become quenched, that have their star formation cut to a moderate level or cut off entirely upon infall? So here's sort of our uh, first order result. On the left there is the distribution of specific star formation rates for our satellite objects, which are in the red, and our control objects, which are in the black. And here, in all um, control samples for the rest of the talk, they will have been matched to the distribution of stellar masses for the relevant satellite samples. And then on the right is, a frac is the uh, conversion fraction as a function 
of the threshold specific star formation rate below which we consider something to be quenched. So the zeroth order result is that um, these L star hosts taken globally convert about 20% of their star forming satellites to passivity. And what we can see by looking at the right hand graph is that, that, that uh, conversion fraction is actually quite flat over a broad range in threshold specific star formation rate. So an L star host doesn't necessarily see that its um, infalling satellite is vigorously star forming versus moderately star forming. It's equally as effective as quenching in both cases. So now we'll move on to our primary result, the dichotomy we see. So on the left is the distribution of uh, satellites of hosts that are star forming. And on the right is the distribution of satellites of hosts that are passive. And one thing I'll mention is that we have here matched the stellar mass distributions of both the star forming hosts and the passive host sample. So this is not an effect of the stellar mass, stellar mass of the host. This is purely a star formation effect. What we see on the left is that the satellites of star forming hosts are in almost perfect agreement with the field. Or again, field is at st fixed stellar mass. And then on the right, we see that um, the satellite sample has a conversion fraction of about 30%. So viewed in um, conversion fraction versus threshold specific star formation rate space, we see that um, uh, galaxy or satellites of star forming hosts are consistent with zero, consistent with the field over the entire range in um, threshold specific star formation rate. Whereas satellites of passive hosts are marginally more effective at being quenched if they come in vigorously star forming. So that's about 30% as the uh, F convert minus 11, 30% of satellites are brought below minus 11 in their, in their star formation rate. And 40% are brought below the vigorous threshold of 10 to the minus 10.5. So um, some of the earlier talks have motivated this connection between star formation rate and um, morphology. So here is distributions of CIRSIC indices of satellites of passive hosts split according to the satellite star formation character characteristic, either star forming or passive. And what we see is that if we take CIRSIC index to be a good indicator of the satellite's morphology, there's no distinction between the, um, between the morphologies of the satellites in the field, despite the fact that the satellites, at least some percentage of the satellites, seem to have been environmentally quenched, whereas presumably none of the field objects were. So I'll quickly go through some possible interpretations by stacking our satellite samples, we were able to um, see that the uh, stacking the velocity offsets, we we're able to see that the satellite samples are uh, dynamically warmer around passive hosts than they are around star forming hosts, suggesting that the passive hosts live in slightly larger dark matter halos. So, one possible interpretation is that we're just seeing a um, dark matter halo effect. But then that has to be viewed in light of the uh, galaxy conformity result of Wyman et al. 2006 or even at fixed dark matter halo mass, uh, star forming hosts were more likely to have star forming satellites than passive hosts. So there seems to be something going on beyond just dark matter halo mass. Uh, another possible interpretation is that these passive hosts are surrounded by um, hot gas in their circumgalactic medium. So this is an image of an isolated elliptical galaxy, NGC 1521. You can see it's hot halo in the x-ray. And then we also, um, we looked at conversion fraction as a function of uh, projected radius. So you can see a gradient in projected radius that could potentially be tracing uh, hot gas in the galactic halo, circumgalactic medium, rather. So uh, other possible interpretations is that you know, this is an infall time thing. Quenched objects have been orbiting for longer, or perhaps it's a formation time thing. You know, parts of the universe that had progenitors of passive hosts and passive satellites formed their stars earlier and got quenched earlier. And so I'll leave my conclusions up there. And I, I will also mention that um, we have other results. We have a paper in the works discussing other effects, specifically sat, or stellar mass effects. So if that's of interest to you, please talk to me. And thank you very much. Sorry, I'll just. Very top. There's. Thank you. And then the uh, second question was um, 
So you show that the quenching declines the projected distance out. Yes. Um, do you have the information to examine how the quenching changes with uh, projected distance relative to the Vero radius? Yeah. Um, we don't. So the, the Vero radius, we got Vero radius information sort of for the whole sample as a whole by looking at MS2. Uh, by you know doing mock observations and uh, the uh, characteristic VO radius was about 400 in that instance. So it seems that the uh, quenching fraction, the conversion fraction, falls to zero inside the VO radius as opposed to at the VO radius or outside of it. Mm -hmm. Outside. Outside. So we only went out to 350 kiloparsecs, which is inside the VO radius. So we we don't have any information on that. Could another explanation be that the orbits are different for the satellites? The satellites, which in fact are sort of more radial. Yeah, radio, so more radial versus Yeah. And everything else without these other explanations. I think that, that would that would definitely be possible. I think we could probably look for tidal effects if that were the case, maybe. <laughs>